In this video, I'll demonstrate how to access eLearning, the learning management system for Cairn University. You can log in with your username or your email address and your system password. So once you log into eLearning, on the top left here, you'll see this little icon next to the logo. And this is where you can control this panel on the left. If you want to see the panel all the time, you click on it and it will display similar to this. And if you want to hide this panel, you can just simply click on that same icon again and it will park it on the left. The same functionality is still available, but just a, a more real estate for you to do your work. The other thing here on the right hand side, we also have this, these blocks and this can be controlled from this icon right here. So I'm going to leave this currently enabled as well as the panel on the left. Now the dashboard can be customized further to your liking. And typically by default you're going to see the course overview and this is filtering or giving you a list of all the courses that you have access in e-learning. This would mean the prior courses from prior years plus any future courses and the current ones. And if you scroll down here you'll see many of them depending on what you have access. Additionally, further down here, you have this recently uh, accessed courses, and this is a listing of the courses that you have accessed just recently, just like the word says recently there. Now, you can control what displays here on the front page by clicking on the drop down here under all, and you could say, I want only those in progress. At this point also it's important to note that the course is in progress or what shows up under in progress it's basically uh, related to the start and end date for the course. So and that is typically controlled by going if I go here to the actual course click on the gear icon I choose edit settings and then under the dates right here for the start date and the end date it has to be, uh, so today's date or what you need there is for these dates to be in the future. So basically this will expire in June or it will be ending up in June 2019 and after that it will be listed under past courses. So if it shows in the past courses but you want it to still be listed in the current courses, you need to change the dates on the course itself, the start and end date. Keep in mind that when you do this, though, it's going to change it for your students as well. So now let's go back to the dashboard. You can change it here to in progress. And notice for specific courses here, you also have these three dots next to the title of the course. That means that you can put a star to specific courses that you want or you can hide specific courses as well from your view. Now if you hide something you're not going to be able to see it under the courses in progress. So in that case to view hidden courses then you have to go here under in progress and then choose to show hidden courses and then that specific one that we just hit it's going to be listed in there or if you choose all courses then it will be listed again under all the courses and it will show up in there. And if I choose hidden here and I want to unhide it just go back to these three dots and choose to show the course and then that will be listed under the in progress courses. So that's basically the filtering here that you can control what you want to see, whether you want to see the past courses, the future courses, or the current courses and such. Now if you put a star to many of the courses that you want, then you can also change the filter so you can see only those courses that you have put the stars on or you can have marked with a star. And that's another way for you to customize the dashboard to list only those courses that you want. Now if you have access to uh, uh, multiple courses, so if it's more than 12 here you can change how many it can show up on the front page, so you can change it up to 48 and then once it goes beyond that you're going to have multiple pages here, it's going to be listed on the right hand side for multiple pages and such. Now another thing that you can do to customize the course overview here is 
also how you want the courses to be sorted. So you could sort them by last accessed, and in that case, the most recently accessed courses will be listed first, or you can show them by course name as well. An additional feature here is that the card view, and the card view is basically the view that we currently have here. You have a little picture of that course, you have the title of it and the percent complete for that course. Now the percent complete, by the way, that is connected to the completion tracking within the course, and it's mostly useful for the students in that course. So for faculty, you probably don't have to worry that much about it's like per the percentage that you have completed for that for the activities in that course. Under the card here, you can change the view to just give you a listing of all your courses. And this is a cleaner view in this case. Or you can change this to give you the summary list of the course. So in this case, it will give you the title of the course along with a description for your course. Now the description here, in case you are wondering, you can change that under course settings. If you go to the actual course and you choose edit settings for that course, there's going to be one of the fields in there for course description. So once you set those preferences to what you like and the view that you like it, then the dashboard it will stay the same. Personally, I prefer the card view in this case. Now notice also on the right hand side here under the uh, the panels on the right here are the blocks on the right. You'll also see a new block here, the timeline. The timeline typically uh, you can choose here how many items to list, but those would be items from the courses that the student is taking and activities that they have to complete. Now those are related or connected with due dates within the activities for them to show up in here. So if you choose to set the due dates, Within the activities, you must also make sure that they are up to date. However, the students find the due dates and such very helpful because it will show up in here in the timeline for them. And also for you as a faculty, it will show up for you to grade those activities as well. Note uh, you can also control here how to sort it by dates or to sort the timeline by courses as well. When you assign dates to various activities in the course, those dates also will trickle down to the calendar as well. Finally, there is also this option here under recently accessed courses. And again, this just has a listing of courses that most recently accessed. If you prefer to have this higher up here in the dashboard, you can click on customize this dashboard and then simply go down to that block, which is recently accessed courses. And then you can simply drag this up, just like you move activities in the course. Once you drag it up, you can click on Stop Customizing this page. And now the most recently accessed course list, it will be showing up on the top. And then you have this other stuff here right below it. So it's up to you how you choose to customize this to your liking. In this brief session, I'm going to go over the general components of a course in e-learning or in Moodle. And this is the blank shell of a brand new course with no content on it related to that specific course. Again, notice here on the left-hand side, you have the various menus for this particular course. So if you wanted to view the participants in the course, you'll just go right here under participants. And notice the various participants here. You notice you can also filter the participants here based on particular roles. If you want to see just the students or the teachers in that course and such, you can just simply choose the role and then those will be filtered automatically. To navigate the course, you can use those links right here on the top. And you basically, to go to the course homepage, one of the options is to simply click here on the course name. 
If the course had multiple sections here, which means multiple one of those topics, they would show up here under the course section. So you'd have topic one, two, three, and such. And once we build it, then we are going to access those modules much simpler as well. Accessing the grades, this is the grade book for the course. And we'll get into the grade book later. And then to see all your courses and other components that we saw also on the dashboard, those will be here on the left. Now we're going to minimize this uh, menu here on the left hand side by clicking on this icon here to the left of the logo. Also on the right hand side, we are going to minimize those blocks as well as we can get started with working in the course. Now typically each course, each blank shell in the course, it includes 17 topics, assuming that the course will be between 15 and 16 weeks, and you have one extra here. Now here on the top right hand side, you also have this gear icon. This is where the magic happens for you to get started with the course. So you need to click on this gear icon, and this is where you can change the course settings. So if you go here under course settings, you can modify here. By the way, we do not recommend that you modify on your own the start dates and end dates here because it messes also with the students. But on your own here, you can put in the description for your course, and that's what will show up on the main course page. So here you can copy and paste this uh, from the syllabus and put it as the course summary. You can even include an image if you prefer by uploading the image in here and then uh, we suggest that you do not mess with the other settings here and just leave everything else alone and just choose save and display. So that's how you can change the course settings. Under the gear icon you have additional options here for backing up and importing the course and accessing the gradebook setup and course completion and such. But the most important component here is the turn editing on. This is the feature or the option that enables you to make changes to your course now that you're starting with it. Now once you click on turn editing on, notice that you have all kinds of new buttons that show up everywhere and that's what we'll go over in the next session. So stay tuned. In the previous session, I covered some of the general components here and the menus on the left and on the top and also on the bottom. But now we're going to get back into the actual components of this actual course and how we can modify it, add activities and such. Now, typically, as you're teaching your course, the idea is that you can post all the resources, whether it is a syllabus, contact information, lecture notes, assignments and assignment details, and quizzes and anything that you can think of about the course, post it on e-learning here. So now the actual components of the course at the very top here is where you would post your course name and such and the contact information. Right below it you have announcements and then those that say topic here, you have topic 1 through 16, those can be modified so they would be like units or it could be separate weeks or it could be however you want to divide your course and organize it for the rest of the semester and such. Now here's what a completed course looks like. So at the very top you have here the contact information, how to get started, the instructor also has a video here embedded in the course page, we have the announcements, course orientation, then we have everything organized by units. So unit one and everything related to unit one is organized in here. Notice it has a starting point. So you have the unit one definition, then the major topic that you're going to cover for that particular unit, and then the dates for that unit and also directions where to get started next. And then you have a listing of all the activities within this course. And we'll go on how to do this for each individual item as well in just a moment. Uh, so these would be various different activities. For example, that's a forum, that's a quiz, and uh, this is an actual assignment and such. Notice also, in this case, the instructor here has labeled 
each activity by a number, and those numbers help in identifying issues. Whenever there is an issue, the student can refer it to item 3.1 in the course rather than having to describe it and such. Plus, it tells them how to proceed with the course activities. So the idea in the course in Moodle or in e-learning here is to organize everything in units where all the components are under a specific unit or that specific week, and then all these units are arranged in a sequential order. Now, for the student to access them, obviously they can go here under the section numbers and jump to a specific section as well. So let's get back to our course here, the blank course that we were working on earlier, and let's work on this. So the first thing that we need to do in the course is to make sure that editing is turned on in the course to modify anything in it. If you see all of these different buttons here, or the green pencil and such, and add the new activity and such, then editing has been turned on in the course. If for some reason editing has not been turned on in the course and you don't see those buttons to modify stuff, then you need to click on the gear icon and then click on the turn editing on option right here. So in this case, you have those specific topics in here. So you have up to 17. You can name them however you want. Like we mentioned a moment ago, you can call them units and such, and it will show you how to modify those as well. If you need more topics in here, you can add them from down here where it says add topics, and you can choose to add, let's say, three more or 40 more or whatever you want, and then it's going to add however many you chose. If you want to delete any of those that you think you don't need, you can click on edit here to, at the topic level, edit, and then choose to delete that specific topic. Now, let's learn how to modify the top of the course to give it a title and put your contact information and such. To modify the top of the course here, you can click on the edit icon for that specific section. So we want to modify this section here and we click on edit. If we wanted to modify section two, then you click on edit over here and such. So we click on edit at the top level, click on edit section, and then we want to give it a custom name for this section. So we click on custom and then we say and whatever the course name is in that case. Then here under summary, that's where you can put any contact information. Put your email, telephone, and you might also want to include in there directions on how to get started. Notice here you have also this, um, these tools, very similar to a word processor, and if you hold the mouse on them, it will show what they do and such. So you can technically format this any way you want. Once you have entered the summary information here, then press Save Changes. And then the information at the top of the course now has been posted. Now this is live for the students for them to access it and such. Now if you needed to modify any of these other areas here, you'd click on let's say topic one and we want to modify that to unit one or week one, whatever you want. And then hit enter. Notice if you press escape or anything else other than enter, you're gonna lose whatever you type in there. So you need to hit enter. And you can do the same thing for topic two, three, four, and so on, and rename those. Now to add any components to the course here for each one of those areas or units or blocks, you'll need to click on add an activity or a resource. And these are all the various activities and resources that you can add to this platform and to this page or to this course. And we'll learn about most of those shortly here in the rest of the tutorial. So you'd be basically picking any of those and then clicking on add, and I'm going to cover those in detail just shortly. 
So stay tuned for the next session for uploading and posting the syllabus. In this session, we're going to learn how to upload the syllabus to the course page in eLearning. There are a couple ways to upload the syllabus, and I'll show you the harder one first, but this will always work with whatever browser you're using. So the first option is going to be to upload it by using the upload a file option. So we're going to click here, assuming you have editing turned on in your course. If you don't, click on the gear icon here and choose Turn Editing On to make sure that you can edit and modify stuff in the course. Now at this point we are going to add the syllabus manually by clicking on Add an Activity and then we are going to scroll down here under the list of resources and activities and we are going to choose here the File option. So we want to upload the syllabus as a PDF file. Then we are going to click on Add and then we can give it a name here. A description, there's no need to put a description. However, if you wanted to have a description in there and post this on the front page, you can do that by simply typing the content in there. And then this option, display description, it will present it and post it on the main course page. Then under select files, you can simply drag and drop the file in here, or you can navigate for the file by clicking on the add button here. And then you click on choose. We are choosing a file from our computer. And then we are going to browse for the syllabus file wherever we have it stored. So in this case, I have it here under eLearning working files and then we're going to find the syllabus which is this file right here and then double click on it we click on upload the file so the process so far is very similar you're navigating for the file just like you attach a file to an email you're navigating you're selecting it and then you're coming back here and then you're clicking on save and return to the course notice there are additional settings here that you can check and see for yourself but as you're beginning with this system, there's no need to mess with any of those settings at this point. Then we click on Save and Return to the Course. And at this point, the syllabus has been posted. And also, this is the description right under that item. I would suggest that as you use those descriptions, make sure you use them conservatively and you do not populate everything on the course to make it kind of too busy. Because the idea is as you post a lot of those resources, it'll be concise and clean for the students as well. It's best actually to post the details within each activity after you have posted, let's say, Assignment 1, then you have all the details for that activity within the Assignment 1 item on the main course page. So that's one way to upload the syllabus. Now, if we click on it, it's going to download it, and then the student will be able to review it and such. The other way to upload a syllabus or files and such is by simply having the e-learning page open and also having editing turned on in the course. And then you can bring up your file manager or file explorer and then you resize this window to be slightly smaller than the e-learning page and then you can simply drag and drop the file that you want on the course page. And this process works exactly the same for lectures as well. So let's say for unit one, I needed to post this into a PowerPoint for that unit. I can simply select it, hold the mouse down, and then drag it to wherever you want it on the course page here. Now, once you have dragged that item and posted on the course page, remember you can also modify the title and such for it by simply clicking on Edit Title and then give it whatever title you want. If you want to modify additional settings and such, then you can click on Edit here and then you choose Edit Settings. And that is the process for any of the items that you post in the system here. 
if you wanted to replace this you can replace it under settings and such the easiest for you might be to simply delete it by clicking on edit here and choosing delete and then simply re-uploading that particular item that is assuming it's just a lecture or lecture notes but not an assignment where students have submitted work and such to upload more than one file in your course page you can simply do it the same way by going here to the file explorer to wherever you have your files and resizing this window similar to what we did earlier and then you're dragging those items and hold down the mouse you're actually selecting those items and you can select items multiple ways by either holding down the shift key or by holding down the control key and selecting one at a time or simply using the mouse here to drag stuff but you're going to select all the items that you want and then you're going to drag those to a, that specific unit as I mentioned earlier it's probably best to rename those activities so that they make sense and they are meaningful for the students also provide also numbers particularly for example this would be 1.1 That'll be 1.2, and so on. So that's how you upload the syllabus, and that's how you upload additional lecture resources and notes and details or documents for your students in the course. The next session I'm going to cover how to configure the gradebook because it's best to configure the gradebook next at the beginning of the course based on your syllabus and then start with the building of the rest of the course. So the gradebook is next so stay tuned. In this session, we are going to learn how to configure the gradebook in the course. It's best to configure the gradebook early on in the course as you're starting to build it. You can also configure it later in the semester and such, but it's not advisable because then the grades will not be calculated correctly for your students. So as you start the course, configure the gradebook first, even though you may not find it very relevant at this stage. So the gradebook is typically based off the course syllabus. So if we go here to the syllabus and download it and open it up and such, one of the sections in the syllabus is going to be the demonstration of learning. So you'll have most likely very similar to something like this, where you'll have major categories of activities or work that students have to do for you that count for a percentage of the course grade. For example, in this case, we have weekly quizzes. And the weekly quizzes are going to be 30%. Then we have two comprehensive exams. They're going to be 20% each. Then we have an e-portfolio, which will be 5%. Homework assignments, 15%. And blogs, 15%. All of those will add up to 100%. So this stage we need to basically tell the system or enter in the system those categories or those major areas for your course. Now to configure this in the course, we go back here to e-learning and then we go to grades here on the left hand side. So that's one option to get there. Or if you click on the gear icon, there is also the gradebook setup option in here as well. So we are going to go on the left because that's where most likely you'll find it the most common. You'll go on the left here on the grades and notice you have an item here or one of the tabs is setup. So under setup, notice right now it has the course code and then the course total, but there's nothing else for this course entered yet. At this stage, the next thing that we need to do is add a category. Now before we add a category I'll just explain 
as to how it kind of works. So by default, the courses are configured to use the weighted mean of grades. What that means is you'll have various categories in the course. Quizzes would be one of those categories that I was covering earlier. The exams, it's another category and such. Now those quizzes would have, for example, 30% of the course grade, but the exams could be 50% of the course grade. So there is a weight to each one of the categories or a separate weight. So we need to add those categories here. Like we saw earlier here in the syllabus, we have quizzes, then they are 30%. Then we have exams, they are 20%. So we go under the category and we type in their quizzes. And then under aggregation, this is where a lot of individuals get confused. The typical setting for the category level will be simple weighted mean of grades. Not weighted mean of grades because we are not weighting the actual quizzes. We are not giving different weights to each quiz. They're pretty much all equal. We just want the system to simply calculate them and give us the mean of grades or the average of those grades. So we have the category quizzes, simple weighted mean of grades, again, not weighted, but just simple weighted. And then we leave that alone. If you wanted to drop any of the quizzes, so let's say you'll have 10 quizzes in the course and you want to drop the lowest one, this is where you can specify in the system that you want to drop the lowest one or two or however many, and the system will figure out who got the lowest grade across all the quizzes and drop that particular grade. And then we go back down here and choose Save Changes. So right now at this stage, we are simply entering the categories. So now we have the course here, we have the quizzes, and we have simple weighted mean of grades. Again, you would want to use simple weighted mean because this is where a lot of the faculty get stuck and frustrated at the same time. The next thing we need to do is we need to enter the next category. So here in the syllabus on the demonstration of learning, we had two comprehensive exams. So we'll call that exams and we choose add category, simple weighted mean, leave everything else alone, press save changes. Next. If we look in the syllabus, we had here ePortfolio, it's 5%. Even though it's just one item, it's best in this case to create a new category for that single item. So we call it ePortfolio. Simple. And then save changes. We go back to the syllabus. And then we had homework assignments. Those are 15%. Again, remember simple weighted mean of grades, save changes. And then notice we have a couple other things here as well, like the weekly technology blog and the PowerPoint presentation. For the sake of time, I'm going to just wrap those up into one and call it final projects or research projects might be a more common name. So add category. And in your case, you want to match it to the syllabus. You'd, you'd have that additional item. In my case, I'm just speeding up the video here so you get the idea. Then we click on the simple weighted mean of grades again and then press Save Changes. So now at this point, we just added all the categories based off our syllabus. But we have not assigned the weights yet. So we have quizzes. Under and quizzes, it was 30%. And then the exams were 20, the ePortfolio was 15, homework was 15, and such. So here, we just put 30 in there, not 0 0.30, but just 30. Here under exams, we said in the syllabus it was 20, so we put 20 in there, 
ePortfolio was 5%, we put 5, homework assignments was 15, and then research projects would be 30 in this case. So you want these numbers to add up to 100. Then we press Save Changes. Now notice you have quizzes, simple weighted mean of grades. I'm emphasizing that because it's important and this is again where many faculty get confused. And then you have exams, simple weighted mean of grades, and ePortfolio as well, homework assignments and such as well. Now if you have cases like for exams where you'll have three or four exams and one of the exams weighs more than the other exams in the course, that's when you can use weighted mean of grades. So you can change the calculation for that to not be simple weighted, but weighted mean of grades. That gives you an opportunity right below this category to say exam one it's 20%, exam two is 20%, and exam three is 60%. So there will be some the activities will show up right below this under the category here when you have the exams created in the system. Now to change it to a different type of aggregation, if you had to do that, you'd need to go here under edit for this specific category. So for example, exams category, we click on edit, choose edit settings, and then change the aggregation right here to weighted mean of grades. Now once you have entered those percentages, of course make sure that you save the changes in the course page. Since we are in the grade book, just one other important thing here as well would be to look here under the letters tab and make sure that the letters match with what you have in the syllabus. So for example here anything above 93 percent it will be a letter A for both any of the activities in the course and for the course final grade as well. Anything between 90 and 93, it will be an A minus. So you want to make sure that this scale here matches your syllabus. If you need to modify the scale here, make sure you're under the letters tab and you click here on edit or edit letter grades or grade letters here and you can override those defaults by using those percentages here. And then once you're done, simply press Save Changes. So this is how you set up the gradebook in the course. It's advisable that you do that in the beginning of the course as you're setting up the course and such. Now to typically view the grades, you'd click on the View tab and then you'll be able to see the grades for your students here. In this case, we do not really have any grades because we are simply starting with this course and nobody has submitted any assignments. In this session, we are going to learn how to add links to YouTube and links to articles in your course and embed them in your course as well. So we are still working on adding resources. So as we get to this point of adding more components, remember here that under Add an Activity, you can choose to add the various activities, and these are graded things. But then you have also resources, so you can add a book or files or a folder or a label or a page and things of that nature, or a URL to something. So the resources are not graded, they are just resources for the students, but then the activities are things that can be graded and the students have to complete them and such. So let's first learn how to add a URL, like a link to an article. So let's suppose we are going here to uh, the library system, so it's uh, library.caren.edu, and we start our search here, let's say competency-based education and uh, search one of the databases and we'll find one of the articles. By the way, try and explore this. We invest quite a bit in those resources, so try to incorporate those resources in your courses and such. Now here we have a PDF article. 
So you're going to browse here. You can filter those resources and such and all that type of thing. But then you find, let's say, the article that you want. Then click on the PDF link to it here. And this is going to give us the actual link to that article. So once you have the link to the article, this could be on a web page and such, then typically you'd copy the URL from up here. Now, since this is a library database and such, you'll have to do this slightly different than copying the URL. So if it were a regular website, yes, you'd copy it from the top. If for articles from the library, you'd look for this linking icon here, the permalink. And then you're going to copy that by right clicking on it and choosing copy or however you copy stuff. So in a PC, it'll be control C. And then we're going to go back to our course here and we're going to add a link to this article. We'll click on add an activity or a resource. We'll scroll down to URL and then we'll click on add. And then we're going to give it a name. Then post the URL in there, control V, like Victor for Windows, or right click on it and choose paste there as well. You could put a description if necessary, and then click on save and return to the course. At this point, the link has been posted on the course page, and we might want to rename this to be 1.3 in this case. And now the students will be able to access and view this. By simply clicking on it, it will take them directly to the article. And there is a link, the actual PDF and such. Now to add a web page, you can also add web pages to your course here. And to do that, we go under Add an Activity or a Resource. Scroll down under the Resources here and choose Page then click on add and then we want to give a name to this resource now under description this is where you describe this activity you could choose to post that in the front page but the content of this web page will be here under this area content most individuals they type it up here on the top and then they get an error and such it's best to simply type all your components and such down in the content area. Now in here you can put all the content that you want for that particular item and such and then format it accordingly as well. So you can basically type anything that you want in here and also format this using the styles here any way that you want and also use any of those tools that you would prefer from this toolbar. So you can do the lists here, the unordered lists and such. You can hyperlink to other sites and resources by simply selecting the text and then clicking on the link icon here and then just put the link to that particular website and such. Or you could even a link to a document on your computer. So let's say you have a e-textbook or what, you can simply select the words here and then choose the link option and then browse and then choose the file that is your textbook. Let's assume that this is the textbook or the file that you want to have the students click on and open it and view it and such. And format this any way you want. Notice you also have here the accessibility checker. So for certain things, it's important that you make sure that there are no accessibility problems for those with disabilities. And then we click on Save and Return to the course. Now, when the student clicks on it, or you can go ahead and preview it, you can click on it, and this is what it will look like at this stage. And I'd suggest that we rename this.
In this session, I will demonstrate how to post links to YouTube videos and also how to embed videos from YouTube on a course page. So the first one will be using the URL option. So we'll first locate the video on YouTube. Let's say that this is our video on YouTube. You can copy either the URL up here on the address bar or you can click here on the share icon and then copy the URL from here. So either one will be just fine. So we copy the URL. We go back to our course page. We make sure editing is turned on in the course and then we click on add an activity. Scroll down to the URL option. Click on add. and then give it a name. Then under the external URL, this is where we'll paste by using Control V or however you paste, and then scroll down and then save and return to the course. At this point, notice the link to that video has been posted in the course page. We can rename it if we wanted to. And if we click on it, it will take us on a new tab here to that particular video on YouTube. What do you want to do with your life? Now, we can also embed the same video on an existing page and we can use the web page option and the web page option will be basically by clicking here on add a resource or activity and then scroll down and choose page here. But we also have already a web page here under item 1.4 and we could embed it in that particular page currently. So we click on edit settings here. And the process, by the way, for this is the same for any of the activities that we'll be doing later in this tutorial as well. So you're just going into the details of that activity under the, the content or description of that activity, and then you can embed that anywhere in your document. Now to embed it, we need to first go back to YouTube, and we go under the share option here, and then we want to go and choose the embed option here. Notice that the dimensions are going to be 560 by 315. That's going to be slightly smaller than what we see the preview here on the left. But we can change those dimensions if necessary. A typical one would be 640 by 360. That's another good size to use. Now in this case, we can select this and copy it. And then we can come back here to our page in eLearning. And then once we are in edit mode here for the content, we can't simply just paste it anywhere in here. We have to use this HTML code area, and we just have to simply paste it in there. So we click here under HTML first, and notice you have all these codes and such. So you can either paste the stuff that we copied from YouTube at the bottom of this document, or find the spot where you want it in the document here where it makes sense between those codes, and then paste it in there. Control V to paste it and such. Now, I know this is a little bit more advanced here, but for those of you that are adventurous, you can try this. Then you click here on HTML uh, button again, and notice that has now been embedded as part of our page. So this will be streamed from YouTube, but it's part of the page here in eLearning. Now, if we press here, save and return to the course, that will take us back to the main course. And then if we want to preview it, we can click here on item 1.4 because 1.5 was a direct URL to the YouTube, but item 1.4 was the embedded video. So notice here we have some content, we have the video, and then we have also additional content that we had earlier for that web page. Again, this works exactly the same way for assignments, and other activities in the course. If you have been watching the previous sessions in this tutorial, 
you'll realize that so far we have been posting resources for the students, but nothing is gradable at this point yet. We also configured the gradebook so that the course is ready and good to go in that area. Now we're going to learn how to configure assignments in your course. One of the most common types of assignments is the case where a student has to type a paper and submit it for grading and you'll provide feedback grading it. So we'll go here under Add an Activity and then we're going to choose the option for Assignment. Next we're going to go down here under Add and then we need to give a title to this assignment. So you'll give it a title and then you're going to use the description area where you'll post the various requirements for this paper. Now you can copy those requirements from the syllabus or from some kind of document that you might have with the requirements and such. In this case I'm just going to paste a bunch of stuff here. It's best to also post the rubric either as part of this document right here or you can post it as a file attachment right below in this area by either browsing for the file and finding and locating it or by dragging and dropping the file. So let's say this is my assignment one details as well. I can simply drag and drop it in here and that was by having this explorer window right above the e-learning page and holding down the mouse and dragging it over to this box. The next thing here is the availability for this assignment. So the availability is when are students allowed to start submitting to this assignment. So you can uncheck the starting point if you want or you can set those but remember any of those dates need to be accurate. There's nothing more frustrating to the students than inaccurate dates. Remember that the due dates and such they also show up on the dashboard of the students and also in their calendar. So it's very important that those are kept up to date and such. So you're going to pick when the assignment is due and the time and the cutoff date if you enable that that will basically not allow the students to submit it after the deadline for the assignment. My suggestion is that you don't set cutoff dates unless you're going to be really be strict and never accept any papers from your students when they are late and such because they'll always have an excuse where they want to resubmit it and you're going to make an exception and if you have a cutoff date then there's no mechanism for them to upload it at least easily then remind me to grade you can specify when you want to be reminded to grade it and such then you have the file submission types. This is where you can specify what are the students going to submit to you. So this online text, that means it's going to be a little box for the students to type their response for this paper. So you could use that for very simple types of assignments and such, but in most cases you want them to type it in Microsoft Word or some kind of word processor and then submit it electronically. Now for most assignments I also suggest that you keep here the online text option. In some cases students will type their paper in Google Docs and they need a mechanism to post the link to that assignment. So the online text will actually help with uh, giving them that flexibility to post the link to the Google Doc and such. Then further down here some of those other settings you don't need to set the types of accepted files and such you can leave those alone and then under the submission settings you don't need to customize those but uh, if you prefer to you can feedback types I would suggest that you leave those in place and not change those I'll cover those shortly the submission types if you want group work and such, that uh, can be defined in here for this specific assignment. However, remember, it, in order to use the group option, you have to have defined the groups in a course, and that's a different tutorial for a different time. Under Submission Settings, 
and notifications here is where you can set a notification so the default here is that you'll be notified only about late submissions so somebody submitted it on Wednesday when they were supposed to submit it on Tuesday you'll get an email notification for that I'll suggest that you keep that on and then also notify graders about submissions that's an option where you'd be getting an email every time a student submits a paper and probably that'll be too much email so leave that as no as stated there then under grade here is where we can specify how we are going to grade this activity in this case we are going to grade it by using points and the points are going to be the maximum number of those points is going to be a hundred now my suggestion would be that if it's small reflection papers one or two pages maybe grade them against 20 points or 30 points but if it's a research paper then grade it against 100 points the higher the number of points the more flexibility obviously you have in grading that particular assignment there are also mechanisms here to use additional scales but for the sake of simplicity we are going to stick to the points for now then there are additional grading methods where you can use direct grading and that's basically you looking at the paper and you're going to make up your mind that this is what grade the student deserves for that paper and such then there are also options here to use a rubric and other methods as well which will cover them in a different tutorial so for most papers you'll use simple direct grading and then under grade category this is important since we configured the grade book earlier in this course now we have the various categories that we defined in the grade book based on the syllabus so that's why I'd recommend that you go back to that video to configure the grade book and how that is done to understand this better but here we specify that that's assignment one it belongs under research projects let's assume and then we scroll down here leave everything else alone you could restrict access here for students based on conditions and such but if you're starting with e-learning out and not mess with the access restrictions and such then under activity completion this means that the students can mark this activity as completed after the students have submitted something to it so basically they have done their part of their job and now it's up to you to grade it so basically for them they have completed this activity then we click here under save and return to the course and then here we have the paper we can renumber it if we wanted to and at this point the students and you can click on it and these are the details for it this is what I had copied and pasted this is that document or it can be a rubric or additional documentation and such for the students and such now the students on their end they will have an upload button right down here so here is the student view from their point of view so they'll be able to click on this assignment and read all the various directions and requirements here and then right below they'll have an option to upload the assignment it will also tell them the time and date how much longer they have to complete this paper of course they will not have a year here but they'll click on upload assignment and then they'll scroll down again they'll have to acknowledge that this is their own work and then this is the online text option where they can post a link to their Google Doc if they're using Google Docs or down here this is where they can upload the paper submitting it to the system so they'll do something similar to that and then they'll press the save changes and then they will see that they uploaded the file at this time and they can preview it and even edit it if necessary so that's the student view on their end and this is the faculty view here on our end now my suggestion would also be that you can probably differentiate the various assignments here by adding a little label in the course page so if we go here under add an activity and then scroll down under label you can click on add And 
you can use one of the styles here if you want. Maybe that's slightly too large, so you can use the small heading and then press save and return to the course. Now the other thing that you can do here is you can move these activities around. So if I wanted to move this assignments option right above, I can simply drag it up and now the word assignments and then I will be listing my assignments here as well. Notice you can also hide a specific assignment. If you don't want to show various activities in the course to the students or your lecture notes or whatever until the class is over, you can hide specific activities within the unit. And then to show it, you click on Edit Settings again, choose Show, and then that will be visible again. If you want to hide the whole unit, you can simply click on Edit, choose Hide Topic, and that hides all the activities from the students. And then you can show it by clicking on Edit and choose Show Topic. And of course, this was a little extra for the assignments, for configuring assignments in e-learning, but an extra tip here with how you hide activities and how you show them as well. One other thing, in case I forget and such, you can also duplicate activities by choosing the option here, duplicate, and it will make a copy of this specific activity with all the various settings and you can just change the content or requirements within the description for that activity. If for some reason you had to modify something within this activity or this assignment, just click on Edit here, choose Edit Settings, and then make the modifications that you want from here. And then make sure you save the changes and go back. The other thing that you can do is click on the assignment, click on the gear icon, choose Edit Settings, and that will take you to the same page to make the modifications. So that's how you create an assignment and how you customize it and such. This probably will be the majority of the items that you'll be entering in the course page and in e-learning. In the next video, it will be on how to grade student work and provide feedback on student assignments. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to grade student assignments or student papers in e-learning. So earlier we configured an assignment and the students are going to complete it and then they are going to submit the paper electronically back to us. Now to grade this assignment, we can click here on the assignment itself and it will see the description and all the various requirements and such. And if we scroll further down, there's an option here for view all submissions. This will give us a listing of all the students in the course here along with the submissions and the papers that they have submitted for us to grade. Now in this case, notice it tells us that the student has submitted it and the time when they submitted it as well as the document that they posted as well. Now to grade it, we click here under grade and then the system is going to give us a preview of the document that they submitted, of the assignment, here on the left. And then on the right-hand side, we'll have the link where we can download the original that they uploaded. Then we have the option here where to enter the grade, and also the option to put in feedback comments and simply type our notes in here and such after we posted our grade. Notice there are a couple options here for recording audio feedback and even video feedback as well for grading the student paper. And further down, we have also here the feedback files that in case where we downloaded the student original paper and we wanted to use Microsoft Word for commenting and such, then we could upload that paper back to the student by dragging and dropping it in this area or browsing to add it from here. Now to preview the student paper, 
in some cases you'll see the front page will have content in there but if you don't see the front page go to the next page and you'll be able to preview each page of that specific student paper and this is one of the pages now notice you have these tools here in the top and this is inline grading so you're basically grading and making comments in the document now what happens is that every time the student submits it even a word document the system is converting it into a PDF document behind the scenes and allowing you to make any of these modifications so in this case you can use any of these tools the commenting tools so basically you're writing or dragging a little box here or however big you want to make that box and you can put in there let's assume and then notice that they become these little call out boxes all over the place additionally you can use the pen tool here to circle items and make notes this way so you're combining or moving from one to the other and then you can just put in there a little comment Notice you can also draw up various specific other boxes here as well and go through that paper this way. By the way, if you needed to delete one of those comments or one of those objects and such, you'd have to choose here the little arrow icon and then go and select that object and then notice there's a little delete button in the bottom right. Some faculty have trouble deleting stuff, so that's how you do it, uh, to remove a component that you selected and such. Now, once you have graded the paper, you'd scroll down here on the right-hand side, and you'd say, okay, this will be 89 points, and you can put additional comments in here. Say, C... It is best to put constructive comments, of course. The students are trying to learn from their mistakes, and that's what would be beneficial for them. So sufficient and impactful feedback and helpful feedback would be beneficial in this case. And then once you have posted your comments, you can press Save Changes or Save and Show the Next Student. In the case where you're grading, the paper and you want to download those papers in Microsoft Word and such, you can simply click here on the link for the assignment. Once it's downloaded, then go into the review tab and then add various comments in there as well. Then once you're done with this paper, you're going to save it where you can find it. And then to upload it back to the student, then you can go here under Feedback Files and you can upload it by using the Add button and browsing for it. And then choosing Upload File. So in this case, the student will receive a graded paper with comments. But you don't need to do both these options. So you can either do the inline commenting here on the left like we did earlier or you can do the word option and then attaching the feedback file now that you posted the comments and such you can navigate to the next student either from the drop down here or choose save and show the next and it'll show the next student or you can go back to the course to the assignment here and view all submissions and then in this area notice that the grade has been posted for this specific student and then you can grade the next student's work now in this case due to the testing environment here no others have submitted the paper and such now if you have a long list of students and you graded papers uh, on regular paper and such and you just want to enter the grades there's an option here where you can enable right below the grade option to have a little box where you post the grades 
and to enable that option you have to go down here to the very bottom so if you are go under the assignment so here is the assignment details you basically click on the assignment you saw the details you scroll down to view all submissions and then if you scroll further down you can choose and enable here quick grading quick grading will allow you to simply post the grades for the students in your course let's say he submitted on paper here and he got 87 and then this one got uh, 78 and this one got 23 now you can choose to save you have to save them otherwise the system is not going to track them so make sure anytime you're doing this press save quick grading changes and now those grades will be posted in the grade book notice you can also change how many assignments to show per page so you can choose to show all of them in that way you have a listing of all the students in the course listed in this page when you're viewing all the assignments in some cases you might also want to download if you're using Microsoft Word for the comments and such you might want to download all the papers for this assignment instead of doing them one by one you can go here under grading action and then you can choose to download all submissions and that will create a zip file and then you're going to extract them and work with each file individually so that's a little bit more advanced and such but this is the process for grading the assignments and such then if you go back to the course here course home page you can also go to the grade book and you'll notice that the grades at this point have been posted and trickling down from that specific assignment so keep in mind when you do the grading do it from the assignment itself and then they will trickle down to the gradebook rather than coming and entering them directly on the gradebook from here because in this case you are overriding those grades also another tip would be if a student has not submitted their work give them a zero right there and that will be posted as zero in the gradebook and it will cause them to panic so that they will have to do the other assignments and such remember that by default when a student does not have a grade for an assignment they are not penalized in the system so the best practice there is even though there are some modifications you can make to count those as zeros it's best to always assign a value to the student's work and that's grading In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to grade papers using video or audio feedback. So let's suppose we have an assignment here. Let's say assignment one. We scroll down to, and we want to grade this paper. The paper will show up here on the left-hand side. You could make comments directly on the paper if you wanted by using this tool right here and point out specific areas or spelling or whatever it is that you want to point out now on the right hand side once you have re reviewed the paper and such on the right hand side here you can place the grade that they received in the paper and then here you type your comments and this was time consuming particularly if you were to give very detailed uh, feedback for your students you can provide feedback either via audio or by using the video recorder so in this case if I want to record video for the student feedback you just click on the video recording thing here now it may ask you to allow there will be a prompt here on the top left depending on what browser you're using to allow the webcam to be utilized so you need to click yes of course for that to take place then here once you press start recording that's when you can start giving your feedback for your students and uh, at this point you can just outline as to what the issues of the paper are and such so you could say a uh, good um, thesis statement however there were a couple areas that need improvement uh, particularly in the specific steps for to improve in public speaking and such so you just need to outline what they need to improve and uh, and such when you're ready you press stop and then you, here you can uh, play this video 
And uh, at this point, if you don't like it, you can re-record it again. And if you like it, you can simply uh, press Attach Recording. Once you're done with your, your video recording here, you can simply press Save and Show the Next. If I go here as a student to this paper, they'll go to e-learning, they'll click on that specific assignment, and then they'll see what grade they got in it. And then down here, they're going to see the video feedback. All they have to do here is press play, and that video will be playing and, uh, for them. Now, they can see the same feedback as well from grades. If they click on grades, and they scroll down under that specific activity, they'll see what grade they got, and also they can see the feedback video that you gave to them. So this is very powerful and very effective, particularly in online courses or any courses to kind of give that personal connection with the students and provide them sufficient feedback, but in less time. So you're grading more papers, providing more feedback, but in less time overall. Now, if you wanted to do the audio feedback only, you can go back to the assignment here and let's uh, go back to let's say the one that I graded earlier I'm going to delete the video feedback and now I want to do audio feedback you just click on audio here plus start recording and then you just provide the feedback with all the comments that you want to include for your student when you're ready to stop the recording, just press stop recording. You'll get a preview here so you can play it and if you want, don't like it, you can re record it. Then press attach recording. Then press submit changes. And then if we go and log in here as a student, the student will see, this is from the grade book, they will see what grade they got and also they'll have an audio recording that they, they can play from the grade book. the feedback now, if they also go under the course activity and go under that specific assignment, they'll be able to see what they submitted, the, what grade they got, and then also what the feedback they got from you from the instructor. They can also see the annotated PDF as well with your comments on it. And then since we are here using the recorder, this tool is also available for you to give directions for your students as to what they have to do or what the requirements for the paper are. So all you have to do in that case is click on Edit Settings and you can use this on any type of activity wherever you see this icon. So you can simply, if you want to insert a quick video here about this assignment, you can simply press Record Video, Start Recording, and then just explain what the assignment is going to be about. For example, uh, create a five or write a five-page research paper with three references and such, and uh, post it before the end of the unit. Then, once you are done with it, you press attach recording, and now the requirements here for this paper have been posted. So all you have to do is press save and display and then the students will be able to review the requirements for this assignment via video. Just explain what the assignment is going to be about. In this session I'll demonstrate how to send announcements to students in the course. So from time to time, it is important that you communicate with the students whether the class is canceled or whether it is an online class and you want to remind them that the class is starting or new weekly announcements in the class. So in this case, to send the announcement, you'll click here under Announcements at the very top of your course. And then you'll simply click on Add a new topic and then type the subject of your email and then type the message for your students here. You can change to format this and such how you want it. Notice that you can use any of those tools on the top here as well. 
And then if you go under advanced area here, you could simply add attachments and such if necessary as well. And then finally, you simply press post to forum. At this point, the system will keep track of this message and you can preview it and students also preview it or view it from the course itself. And then within 30 minutes time or any time between now and 30 minutes, the system will also send an email out to all the students in the class. So there is no need for you to email them via Outlook or webmail or, any, or through the participants area here and such or however else you have been doing it, it's best to send those announcements directly from the course module here from the announcements module in the course. In this case, the system again keeps track of what was sent out. The students, in case they missed anything, they can always go back to the announcements area in the course. Now typically also, if this panel uh, on it's not hidden on the right and the students have not hidden that panel on the right the latest news will also the latest announcements will be showing up here on the right hand side as well on this block and you can add here a new topic a new announcement directly from that block or you can preview what you had sent earlier In this session, I'll demonstrate how to configure forums in a course in Moodle or eLearning. So let's suppose that in our course here, we want to create a forum, a weekly forum, for our students to discuss a specific topic and then for them to interact with one another. To do that, we could use the forum module within Moodle. We click here on Add an Activity or a Resource, and then we choose the forum option. Click on add and then simply give it a name. In this case I'll just try to keep the numbers in sequence in the course activity so I'll call it 1.7 and then here under the description area once we put the title we are going to type in there the content that you want the students to discuss. So we'll press here control V. I just copied this from earlier and then you can put in there additional details as well as to how it will be graded and what you expect them to do. So you state they need to post their initial discussion and then respond to at least two other peers in the class and then how you're going to grade this as well. Now there are different types of forum discussions that you can use in the course and the default one here is what we recommend that you utilize. Basically what that will do is create a listing different thread for each student in the class. So once each student responds and posts their response, then other students in the class will be able to go and engage and reply to that particular student. So there will be separate threads. If you want the students to first post their own and then see other peer responses, then you might want to consider the Q&A forum. However, there is a tricky part to it that you need to post the question initially. You need to do that initial post that I'll show in a little bit and how to do it. But for in most cases, we do recommend that you simply use a standard forum for general use. As far as finding out more details for these, uh, you can always click on this little question mark and it will explain additional details as well. So then you could go under other areas and other settings here. We do not recommend that you do cutoff dates and uh, starting dates and such. You could if you are going to stay on top of those dates. However, it can frustrate the students if you don't make clear, if you don't have the right settings in the forum and then if you don't notify them as to what the parameters are going to be for that particular forum. Under attachments and such, you could control how much or what the students can upload and how many words and all that type of stuff to display the word count if you prefer. Then subscription and tracking. This is basically what controls the correspondence. Typically we recommend that you use a subscription mode here to optional subscription. It allows the students to get email notifications 
or it allows them to unsubscribe and not receive them. We have found that some students want the notifications, some others don't. And then a read tracking, you can choose to make this optional as well. Basically, then the students will see and you'll see how many forum posts you have not read yet in the course. Other areas here that you might want to consider and look at would be under the grade area. This is where you could specify under which project this falls under. Uh, provided you have configured the grade book, then under ratings, this is kind of key. This is where you specify whether you are going to grade each post or not grade it. And this is what tells the system to show this forum activity in the grade book or not show it. So basically, in most cases here, you could choose sum of ratings and this setting, or you could use the average of ratings as well. Sum of ratings would be, let's say you're going to grade the first post out of 80 points and then each subsequent post up out of 10 points. Then the system will add, let's say, 75 that the student scored for the first post, then 10 for the second post, and 9 for the third post, and that came to 94 out of 100. And in that case, the system will record an A, for example, in that, uh, for that activity in the course. If you choose average of ratings for each post, that means that each post you're going to grade it against 100 points, and then the system is going to add however many times the student participated, and in each discussion, in each response and such, and then the system is going to post the average of those ratings. Now, the problem with the average of ratings is, is that sometimes the student may do poor work on the first post that requires more effort, and then their grade gets bumped up because on their responses they can bump up their grade. However, that's why we suggest that you use a sum of ratings here. Now, once you go here under sum of ratings, this is where you can then specify how many points you're going to grade against. So if you state it up in the description here, 80 points for the first and 10 points for each subsequent response, then we'll use 100 points. So just try to keep in mind what you said, that high ceiling or the standard there. Now, you can also use here, instead of points, you can use a particular scale if you'd prefer. And these would be either system-based scales or customized scales for your institution. For example, here at Cairn, we have a bunch of those defined here. And one of them is, for example, the School of Business Forum Grading. Or you could have uh, something like this, for example, novice, uh, competent, proficient, uh, proficient, or exceptional. So any of those, basically the idea here would be that once you choose either one of those, instead of assigning points, you're choosing one of those options listed in here. So for now, I'm going to keep this configured as using points, and we're going to use 100 points. We don't suggest that you mess with the restricting of ratings, putting any dates in there, because then the system will not allow you to grade any of such stuff after that deadline that you might set in here, and then you're going to wonder what happened and why it's not working. Under activity completion, you can choose to utilize it. By default, it is that students can mark this activity completed uh, manually. However, you can change this to be conditional, where the student would be required to have three posts or discussions. And that's when they'll get a check mark or the system will mark it as completed. If this doesn't show up on your end, that means that in your course configuration, the completion tracking is not enabled. Now, this stage, we click on Save and Return to the Course. And at this point, we have configured the forum for this course. The students will be able to click on it. They'll see what the requirements are, the additional details, and then they'll simply click on Add a New Discussion Topic. They'll put in a subject, the message here, and then they'll press Post to the forum. 
And in the next segment, I'm going to demonstrate how to grade one of those forums and how to post the grades for each student's responses. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to grade or rate the forum posts in e-learning or Moodle. In this case, we have a forum that we created and configured earlier here, and we'll click on it. And we have the forum requirements here, and then further down we have the responses from the students. Now, the responses typically will show up as separate threads similar to this. And that's because we chose the standard, the standard forum format earlier. For me as an instructor to go and grade this forum or rate this post, we can click on each one of the titles here under the discussion column and notice it shows who submitted this. And then we'll be able to see here the content when it was posted and such and what the student posted as well. Now, right below here, this is where we can rate this post. So if earlier we stated that we are going to rate this against 80 points for the initial response, and then any subsequent comments and such, we're going to rate them against uh, 10 points. So in this case, if he did really well, in this case the Karen student, then they would be awarded 80 points. But in this case, let's say uh, they didn't do very well and let's say I want to award 76 points so you simply from the drop down here so you select 76 and then notice it's going to post it right here. Now for each student if you prefer you can also click here under reply and then you can type a short reply to that particular student provided you also check this private reply option. So this would be uh, explaining as to why they missed a couple of the points. Now note, obviously, this if it's going to be trying to help the student or steer them in the right direction and such, and you don't want this to be public to other students, make sure again that you check the private reply post. Otherwise, by default, that response is going to be posted for all the students in the class. Now to respond to this particular post, in the class and to respond to all students let's say for all students you simply press reply you type your reply in here provided the student's name is John and then you want to steer them to think in more in depth as a whole class on that specific topic or point of discussion so the idea is that it's best, at least, for any of the responses in the class to target one response per student per week. In that way, it demonstrates that you are involved in the class and that the student appreciates that feedback that you're providing for them in their work and such. Obviously, if you're teaching an online course, the regular and substantive interaction is achieved typically by participating actively in the forums throughout the week. So here you'd provide additional feedback for the student and then you'd press submit and that will be public feedback by default. Now notice if it's a private reply, notice it's over here, it will state that it was a private reply to that particular student. If you need to delete a reply that you accidentally entered or typed or whatever there, you can press here delete and then it will delete it. If there were more than students interacting and they're engaging in this threaded discussion and such, then it will look very similar to this. Let's suppose here that the Karen student here replied to my comment and now now, of course, you also want to encourage your students to provide substantive responses and content in their replies and not just uh, saying good point and that's it. And that would be best to be included in the requirements for the discussion in the forum. So that was the response from the Karen student. Now, if I go back as the instructor here in the same discussion thread here, Notice how it's aligning them to have like this tiered layout within the discussion. 
Now, if I wanted to reply back to the Karen student, I could just simply post my response right there and then press submit. Okay, so that's how you rate the posts in the course and how you provide feedback to your students. Now, typically, when you have a lot of those forums and threads in the course and you want to move from one to the other and such, it might be helpful to also open these in a new tab for easier grading. So simply right click on each one of those links here of discussions and open them all up and then you can simply scroll down, rate everything, grade everything here and provide feedback and then go to the next tab and the next tab. Or you can use the controls here next to each uh, forum where it says go to Hubert's post next and such. And that will take you to the next forum as well. But I find that using tabs, it's the easiest way. Now to check the grades for this, and by the way, to rate or grade the responses from the, each student, you do them in a similar way. So typically the top one, the first one, you would rate it against 80 points. And as those subsequent ones, for example, the response here from the student, you would want to rate that against 10 points. And you simply pick the points in here. You can press reply, send a private reply to the student and such. And then that grade is going to be posted on the grade book. To get to the grade book, we click here on the left hand side under grades. And then we go under that specific activity. So notice here 1.7. And notice that Karen student here got an 85. Now you'd say, why did they get a B and not an A yet? The reason for that is because the system is configured for three responses and three interactions, and they participated only twice on it. So they got a 76 the first time and then a 9 on the second attempt. If they had responded a third time, and also if you graded it, then they probably would have gotten something in the 90s there and potentially an A minus or an A. So that's also important to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind as well is that you can always override the grade directly from here. But if you are doing that, and let's say you want to award them a 90, 90 points, then make it enter here. Make sure that you communicate that to them. So that's how you grade the forum posts in the course and uh, provide feedback to your students. Another important component of a course is the use of quizzes. So the system will grade automatically true and false multiple choice questions and even matching questions. And then for essay questions, you can go back and just grade the specific essay questions in the course. So in this session, I'm going to cover how to create a quiz using e-learning. So we are in the course here. And now for week one, we want the students also to take a quiz. So in order to take a quiz, by the way, if your textbook comes with a test bank, then those questions can be imported and that will probably be another video. But for this video here, I'm going to demonstrate how to create a quiz from scratch, including the questions. So first, it's two stages for it. First, you create the shell for the quiz. We're telling the system there is a quiz. And then the second part of it is to add the questions to the quiz. So now we click on add an activity here after we have turned editing on in the course. Click on add an activity or a resource. And then we scroll down here under quiz. So we locate quiz and then click on add. Then in here we're going to call it chapter one quiz. And then under the description, this is where you'd give them a lot of details. Read chapter one, it's going to be a quiz with so many questions and so on and so on. You can also give additional directions that the quiz is going to be timed. Once they start, don't switch to other browsers. Re reference here also the academic integrity policy and things of that nature and so on and so on. But basically as many directions as possible. The other thing here is that there are a lot of settings for the quiz setup. One of the options here is notice there's an option here for expand all. Expand all expands all of these options. 
So you can set the quiz so that it opens at a specific day and time. And then you can choose to close the quiz at a specific time as well. You can also specify a time, how many minutes the students have to take the quiz. However, keep in mind, if, if you do not need the time limitation, don't put it in there, particularly if it's a long quiz, because it really can frustrate and put additional pressure on the students. However, if you're focusing on it, it's a key quiz, and if you're focusing on academic integrity and all that type of thing, then you specify the time limit as well. Then if you scroll down here, you have the grade section, and this is, uh, typically it'll look like that, but we, are, we just expanded it above, so if it didn't look, just click on the word. Then we click here on cat uncategorize, and we choose which category this falls under. Again, the gradebook has to be configured first, if, so we click here on quizzes, and then you can specify grade to pass if you need to, and all that type of thing. Then attempts, you can also specify how many attempts you want the students to try. How many tries do they get for the quiz? You can allow them multiple times. If the quiz, my suggestion would be that if the quiz, it's not critical to the course, it's just a practice one, it's just to reinforce the learning and so on, maybe you give them multiple tries. But then under the grading method, you can change it so that either the highest grade of all of those attempts takes effect, or it can be the average grade, or it can be the last attempt, and so on and so on. So it just depends on what your preference is. Now here under the layout, this is where you can choose how the questions will be presented to the students. So in this case, it's every question, but yet you can configure it so it will be every five questions. So you have 20, page, uh, 20 questions, it's going to be four pages of the quiz for the whole quiz there. So basically five questions per page. Notice there's an option here for show more, whether they want the navigation, you can force the students so they have to go in a sequence, or you just let them go free from question to question that they may prefer. For enhancing academic integrity, you can choose to shuffle within questions, and also as far as the feedback, you can choose want to have the feedback, whether you want it deferred at the very end of the quiz, or you could have immediate feedback after they try each question as well. So then as far as the review options, this is where you can choose uh, whether to display the correct answer, yes or no, during the attempt, after the quiz is closed, and so on. So you make your own mind, make up your mind basically from there. And then you scroll down, you can even require a password for this quiz. Now cases where you'd want a password for the quiz, are, because you can limit it by the time, but let's say that two students didn't show up for the quiz, and now they have to take it up, take the quiz late. You can set a password in the quiz for them to take it either earlier or later and share the password to the students. So that's kind of the key for the password there. You can also reinforce so that they can't try it unless a certain amount of time has passed. The browser security was suggested to leave it alone. If you want to do enhanced browser security, that usually tends to cause more issues. Then uh, the overall feedback, this is basically where you can give them automated feedback. If they scored uh, between, let's say, 90 here and 100%, you can say, great job, you're going to do well in the course, keep up doing the same thing. But if they scored, uh, 60 and and below or whatever, then you could say you're going to fail the course. So you can give them automated feedback based on the score that they get. So then you scroll all the way to the bottom here and then click on save and display. So all that we did so far, or we could do save and return to the course since we have been doing that for other activities. So at this point, we just have told the system that there's going to be a quiz and there are some parameters to the quiz, but yet we have not really added any questions to the quiz. So now the stage number two here is to click on uh, and configure the actual quiz questions or add the questions. So we click on the quiz here, chapter one quiz, and it says, well, there are no questions added yet. So we click here on edit quiz and then this is where we add the actual questions. So we click here on Add, and we choose Add a New Question. 
If we had a test bank, that's where we'd get the questions, but for now we just have to add them manually. Now you can add all kinds of questions in the quiz, as you can see here on the left-hand side. Multiple choice, it tells you what it does, true and false, and so on and so on. Typically, it's those th it's three types of questions that are used primarily. Multiple choice, true and false, and then essay questions. So let's create first a, true, a multiple choice question. So you give it a name to the question. This is just how it will be identified in the system. So you could say Q1. And then, so this would be our question. We could format it to look different. And then here it would be general feedback. If you wanted to specify general feedback for that specific question, uh, whether they scored it correctly or not, this is where you put general feedback. And the answers would be here. So you have basically option A, B, C, and so on. So we say the four functions for a computer would be input. So if they choose that, they get no grade. If they choose only output, that would be none as well. So they get no, no grade for it, or they get a zero basically, or a failing grade. And then choice three, it would be Let's say that's not the right answer either. And then choice five is, now remember here you can't say all of the above because the order will be scrambled. So in this case, we'll say all of the above and it will say 100%. So if they choose all of them, all the presented options, then they get a score of 100 in that question. Now we click on save changes and that is one question already added to the quiz. That was a multiple choice question. Notice these dots here. Now we go and add another question. And now we'll add a true and false question. So we click on true and false, add, we give it a name. In some cases you can just copy and paste the same question from the title into the question text. And basically over here it says correct answer. You need to tell the computer which one is the correct answer for this statement. So in this case, we want to say that is correct, that's true. And then we click on Save Changes. So that was a second type of question that we are adding to a quiz. Then we can go here and add another question, and let's say we want to add this question as an essay. Keep in mind that essay questions will not be graded automatically by the computer, and then you can say how many points this question will be, and then click on Save Changes. Now, this is where you'd specify the points. So let's say this last one, instead of counting it all equal, let's say I want this to count more. So I can simply click here on Edit Maximum Mark, and I can say I want that to count as eight points, while the other ones count only as two points and the whole quiz will count only as against 10 points. You can have this against 100 points, let's say, but that, what that means is that this question will be 80% and those will be only 10% each. So once you have determined the questions and also the maximum points and also the points for each question, you click on Save and basically the quiz is ready for the students. Now you can also preview it if you click here on preview, this is how it will look when the students open it up. And they'll have a timer here because we chose 20 minutes earlier. And then go and take this as a student. This is what the students will see. So they'll go to the course. They'll click on chapter one quiz. They'll read the directions. They'll have how many attempts they have, how many minutes they are allowed, how, the, how it's going to be graded. They'll click on Attempt Quiz Now, it has a timer, and that's it. So they put the feedback here for the essay question, and then it will give them a grade. It will give them a grade right away with the correct answer and not the correct answer, but then the essay is not graded yet. So they finish it. Now you as the instructor, you can go back in here, and now you need to grade the essay questions. So notice it says here, 
attempts one. That means that one student tried to take it and took it. Notice down here you have the report. Here's the attempt. This is the options that they missed. And then here is, you can actually click right here and see exactly which questions, how they did in each question as well. Now notice for question number three, it says here requires grading. So you can either click over here to requires grading, or you can go under the quiz area here, or quiz administration, and there's this option here for manual grading. In manual grading, this is where you can grade all the essay questions for all the students from one spot. So you click on grade all, and then it will display all the students' essay questions one after the other. And you can put comments here, and then you can give them a mark, zero out of eight, for example, and then save and go to the next page, and then the grade will be posted for the students. So that's how quizzes work. You basically have to create, define the quiz parameters first. You add the questions to it, and the students take it. Once the students take it, the grades will be recorded in the gradebook. If you have essay questions in the quiz, you have to go in and grade them manually. In this video, I will demonstrate how to create a quiz using drag and drop into text type questions in eLearning or Moodle. So basically, you have a bunch of questions with blank areas where the student can drag and drop the right answer from a list of provided options. So let's get started. So basically, we'll need to go here to the course first, and we go to a specific week, and now we are going to first create the quiz. Click on Add here for the quiz give a name to the quiz, a description, fill out also any of these other options as to when to open the quiz, when to close it, how long the students have to take the quiz and so on. Then under the grade you might want to post the category where the grade should show up. Then as far as the question layout you can have one question per page or more than one question per page and so on. And then if you want to shuffle within the questions you can do that from here as well. Then deferred feedback, that means that the students will get a feedback as to what they got right or wrong at the very end after they complete the quiz. This is where you can specify when the students, uh, whether they can see the proper answers or not, whether uh, right after the attempt or later after the quiz is closed. So this is pretty much if you want to guard the answers to your quizzes. All of these so far are just general for any quiz in Moodle. So now at this point, we click here on the very bottom and we choose save and return to the course or we could click on save and display. For now, I'll just choose save and return to the course so that we see the item has been created. So far, we just have created the shell for this quiz. So now we click on the quiz again. And now here on the right hand side, we click on edit quiz. Now on edit quiz, this is an option for us to add questions to this quiz. So now we can click here under add and then choose a new question. And this is where this tutorial basically starts with what I was trying to demonstrate is that we want to create a quiz with questions from drag and drop into text. So notice it's going to be missing words in the questions and those questions are going to be filled with the proper answers by the student dragging and dropping in there. Now we click on add here and in this case I'm going to create just one question. So you can give here the question name. This is just for you to identify this question. So you could say question one. And then here under the question text, this is what the student will see. So this can be separate questions in there or separate areas, or it could be one sentence with multiple missing uh, spots in there. And now wherever you want the student to fill in the blank here, what you need to do is you need to put these double bracket like that, the square ones, then one, that would mean uh, this is blank number one, and then double bracket again, so a computer is, the answer would be there, an electronic device which accepts input. So we want to have that as option number two with double brackets. Again, we put number two, accepts input. And we could say it processes data. And in this case, I'm basically giving them a tip here. I'm leaving the stores data already as part of the sentence there. But basically, as you can understand so far, any of those options, we want them in double brackets. And then uh, one, two, three, those would be the actual answers. 
Now here under default mark, you can leave it as one in this case, or since we have four of those, maybe we could make it four points, but you'll have a chance to change those points as well in the next screen here. Now under uh, general feedback, you can specify here uh, whether they got it right or wrong, what kind of feedback you want to give to them. Now in here, the next thing that you want to do is this is where you put the right answers for these missing the fill in the blanks here. So now we choose shuffle. We want to shuffle those um, answers. And the first choice here would be a computer is an electronic device. So here we put electronic. And then option two, it would be which accepts input. And then option three would be processes data. And then stores the data and then produces output. So basically, if you have more than, than four areas, you just keep on adding other sentences. Those you could make them separate or you could have them all uh, sequential like a story. Now, these options here uh, add to group one. What these are basically, typically you want to leave those all in group one. It's just saying it's going to list them all one after the other, just like we listed them here. Now, if you have cases where some of them would be nouns and the other ones would be pronouns and you want them in two, two separate sections separated from each other, then you'd say, okay, well, this one I want it in group two and then this one I want it in group two. So it's going to just bundle them together when the student sees the options. In our case, for most of the cases, you're going to just have them listed randomly there for the students to view them, no specific grouping. Unlimited, that means that uh, do you want to allow the use of one of those options to be used more than one time as the student enters the answers here. And then basically you can add more choices if you need it uh, here. Combined feedback, if you wanted to provide a specific feedback when it's partially correct and so on, you can try that for yourself. Under multiple tries, we're not going to go into that for now, but uh, if, they ch if you give them multiple tries, how much the penalty would be and so on. Now you click on Save Changes. And at this point, notice it's, it's marking it against four points for that question. And if you wanted more than that, so let's say the quiz is um, 100 points and then you have only one question for this quiz, then you can change the number of points right here. So you could make that to 100, or if you had five questions, each of them would be up to 20 points for each question. So it depends on how your quiz is going to be organized. Now to preview this, you can simply either click on the question to actually preview it, or you can preview the whole quiz. Now to preview this quiz, Let's assume it's ready for the students. We're going to have only one question. Now notice this is how it will look. Uh, basically, the student will take here a computer is, take electronic, drag it over here, which accepts input, drag it over here, processes data. And the highlighting here is happening because of my mouse. Now the student basically matches these up and then click on next. In this case, I have only one question to the quiz. I click on submit and finish, and I should have scored 100 points in this case. And the student can review it, and that's it. Now, in some cases, uh, you might want to give the students more choices than there are actual options here. So if I wanted to edit this question, I can go here under this little gear, right here in front of the question, and I can scroll down here and add additional options. Basically, you're just trying to confuse them with more options and there would be answers for them. Then click on save. And that's how basically you can create quiz using drag and drop fill in questions. Hopefully that is helpful and uh, feel free to check out the other tutorials on e-learning or on the YouTube channel. Thank you. The next item that I'm going to cover here in uh, using e-learning or Moodle is the use of lessons, how to configure a lesson and how to use the lesson module in e-learning. So before I go into the details of configuring it, I'm going to go over and show you what an actual lesson looks like and what you can do with the specific lessons in 
Moodle so that we get an overall idea as to what's possible. So for example, here we have an online course. And by the way, we use those lessons quite a bit in online courses. And if we scroll down here to one of the modules, by the way, all of these that have this little icon in front of them, those are usually lessons. So I'm going to go to one of those lessons here, let's say multiple intelligences and learning styles. So if I click on this, the lesson would look something similar to this for the students, or you can do something very similar to this. And it has a lot of flexibility in what you can do with a lesson module. So basically you can present new content and the new content can be in text format. It could be pictures. It could be videos, uh, a string of videos uh, specific to a, a topic. And then after the student completes that video or watches this content, the student can move to the next page. And the next page can be an assessment of some form. So in this case, we have a form of assessment where the student will do some matching of the questions. And of course, I'm not choosing the right options here. So I'm just uh, picking and just for the sake of submitting them. And then once they completed that section, you can direct the students to view additional content. So basically, you're taking them in a sequence of pages once they complete a task to move on to something else and then assess them on that content and then have them watch or review some additional content. For example, here we want them to go to a website and at the end they have to describe something. So then they move to the next page and then in the next page we introduce new content as well and then they end the lesson. In some other cases, you could have them take, uh, of course, we saw an example of a short quiz to assess them, but also you could have true and false multiple choice questions, which is that type of quiz that you just saw. And also you could have essay questions. So I'm going to demonstrate at this point as to how do we configure one of those lessons for our course. This is an advanced feature, but yet it's a very powerful one. And if you can get to use it in your courses, this would be very valuable for your teaching experience. So what we do here is we turn editing on first in the course, and then we go to add a new resource or actually activity in one of the blocks here. So we're going to go ahead and do this in week one. So we go here under add a new activity or resource, and then we are going to go and choose here adding a lesson. So we'll click on add. And at this point, we need to configure the shell or to configure, just tell the system what this lesson is going to be like and the, all the different parameters. We're not actually creating contents of the lesson yet. The first step is just to define to tell the system what the parameters are. So we're going to call this lesson one. You could post a description as well in here, but uh, it's not necessary. This is the content that will be posted on the main page in the main course page. So you could say review all the pieces of this lesson. You'll be assessed throughout the lesson, all that type of stuff. So then you have here the appearance section of it. And by the way, you can expand all of those blocks by using this button here on the top right. So under appearance here, you could add additional files if you wanted to, like resource files. But instead of doing it there, I'll show you how to attach files in a moment. Now, as far as a progress bar, if the lesson is going to be very complex with multiple pages and so on, you might want to add a progress bar, but it's not necessary. Uh, display an ongoing score. This is if you have quizzes throughout uh, the lesson after they watch or uh, review certain pieces of material. You're quizzing them. They can see the score, how they did so far. So it's up to you to choose that, but uh, don't enable it unless you have those quizzes embedded in it. Display lesson menu. This is if you have multiple pages again, it's going to display a menu for the lesson. So let's go back here for a second. And in our lesson here, we didn't have a lesson menu displayed. This would be, it would have a new section here as to what the different areas of the lesson are. So if I go and enable them here, this is again a lesson that we have already configured for another course. And if we choose yes to that option and then save and display, 
Now notice it displays us, because this lesson had only two pages, it displays us the menu for this lesson. So that's what that option is. In some cases, if you have more than two pages, it's going to be uh, many more pieces to it. So that was just the example there. Now let's go back to our course here. The next item here, so display lesson menu, most of the time you don't want to enable it unless you have multiple pages. Minimum grade to display menu, just you can skip that. Slideshow, you can skip that option as well. And if you wanted to look through any of these options, it'll give you an explanation here. Maximum number of answers. This is like if you're creating a multiple choice quiz, it's going to tell you that the default, when you choose multiple choice question, you'll have four choices for your answers. That's what that option is. Linking to other activities, you could make it so that it's conditional. They have to complete a previous activity before they do the first. This one, we're not going to go into that depth at this point. And then availability. I don't suggest that you enable those due dates and deadlines and all that type of thing. However, it's up to you, but uh, if you do, you have to keep up with those dates and times. If you choose to use availability, I would suggest that you hide it from the main course page and then enable it from there. As far as the time limit, it's an option that you can enable so that they have only a certain time to complete it. Now, under flow control here, allow students to review. Uh, it would be best to allow them to review the, the questions or to review the content because again this is just a lower level type of learning more type of formative questions and so on provide an option to try a question again that's up to you whether you want to when you're assessing the students whether you want them to give them a second chance to try the questions as far as how many times to attempt the questions if it's a just practice lesson or a easy a low score you can give them more than one try. So usually I suggest you give them five tries and then in one of the other options here we're going to see which one takes priority basically, which attempt takes the highest priority. Now as far as grading you can have those so that they are graded. You can assign points to them uh, against 100 points, 10 points like we learned for other activities and then you can also specify as to where this falls under, under what category. The grade category drop down here, it'll show up if you have configured the grade book. So if you have not configured it, you need to go back to the grade book and take a look at uh, that part of the video of this tutorial, how to configure the grade book. So for now, I'm just going to put it under home assignments. Practice lesson, yes or no. If you say that it's a practice lesson, what that does is the students can tinker with it, but nothing will be recorded in the grade book. Usually, we do not say yes to this option. We want it to be in the gradebook. Retakes allowed. You can consider to allow them to retake it. And then the handling of the retakes. Uh, usually, it's best to encourage the students to take it as many times if it doesn't count for too much of the course grade. And they usually suggest to uh, use the maximum. And then under other options here, you can check those for yourself, but we are not going to need to mess too much with this. The other option to consider is, and this is new in this release, is uh, under activity completion, you can choose to enable this option. So you could say, mark this activity as complete after the student is required to have spent X number of minutes on it. So if you expect the students to spend 30 minutes in it, and it's a 30-minute video or whatever it is, and they're spending only five minutes on it, then there's potentially a problem. So you could just say it's going to be marked completed only after 30 minutes have passed. So now we are done. We click here, Save and Return to the Course. Of course, we could click Save and Display. We'll choose Save and Return to the Course. And we are done with all the parameters for the lesson activity itself. We have not added any new content, it's just parameters. It's very similar to configuring the quiz or the forum. So now we click on the lesson one, and there's not really much that you'll see at this point. It's asking us, now you have a lesson, but you have no content for it. So what do you want to do first? Well, we want to potentially add a content page first. So we want to add some kind of resources, something for them to view. If you want to assess them first, that's where you would add the questions. 
So typically you want the content, some kind of content first. So we do the content, click on add page content, and then we give it a title. So we could say defining computers. And basically you can add all kinds of uh, content in here. It's basically like building a web page at this point. Now you could add also, let's say you could add an image here. Now notice if this button is only one row here, you can choose to make it more than one. Now you can click here to insert an image and then you just upload an image to your lesson by choosing a file, going to wherever your lecture resources are and then choosing to upload the file. Of course this is not necessarily the one that you want but uh, just as an example and then you can change the parameters of the image here. I just clicked outside after I chose dimensions. I'm going to say I want it on the right hand side and then I'm going to click on insert and click OK. Now it's on here on the right hand side. You can also include here a link, uh, so you can say review also this PowerPoint. And then you can hyperlink this, the word this PowerPoint, by simply uh, selecting the text, clicking on this icon here for inserting links, and then going and locating your PowerPoint for this lesson. So notice it says insert URL. You can either post the URL from a website or wherever you may have it on Google Drive or wherever or you can simply upload it to the system by clicking on this browse button over here. Now we click on, uh, usually it's click on choose upload from your computer, choose the file, and then find your lecture. And then upload it. Then click on insert, you can leave all these other options alone. And now this is hyperlinked. You can make it uh, bold, I'd suggest that you make it bold. And by the way, you can insert PDF files, study guides, that same way as well. That's what they do in some of the courses. We put a study guide linked in that area. Now, after you review all of these, also watch this video. And you can go into YouTube and get a video and post the link over here. So if we go to YouTube here and pick one of the videos, whichever you want or whichever applies to your lesson, of course. Now, there are a couple ways to insert the video. The easiest one is to copy the URL here. We go to our lesson here in eLearning or Moodle, and then we simply paste it in here and hit enter. And then the system will actually build the video or display the video right there. Or the other option is that you could hyperlink it highlight in the link and click on insert and there is a third option to actually embed it using the code from Google as well so I'll try to show that in a moment here so then you could have additional instructions in there then the next thing here it's saying content one in the bottom and this is kind of confusing it's just gonna put a button there in the bottom so what do you want that button to say? You could say, I want uh, students to click on next page. Or you could say, continue to next page. So basically, this is just a control button. That's what this content one is. Of course, you can link to different pages and so on. You could say they're lecture two, and then students click on it, it takes them to lecture two. Then this item here right below it, it's saying jump. It's saying, where do you want to jump? When the student clicks on continue to next page, what do you want the computer to do? So you say, I want them to move to the next page. Or you could have it uh, then move to a specific page within your lesson. So typically, you just choose next page. So these are the two most common options here. Now you have also content two, three, and four. This is pretty much more to confuse you. I'll just ignore those for now. They are a little bit more advanced, but um, it's for more buttons at the bottom of the page. So then we click on Save Page here. And at this point, we have configured the first part of the lesson. Or we have configured the lesson with just one page of content. And to review it, you can go here under Review. And this is how it will show up. 
So it's, uh, the students will click on it, it will bring them up to this page. They will not have these buttons here, edit and all that stuff. Actually, let me demonstrate what it looks from the real student's point of view. So the student will go to the, the lesson. They will see this. These directions, they have an image here. Of course, they don't go together here at this point, but uh, they have access to the PowerPoint. They can click on it and download it. And then they can view the YouTube video by simply clicking on it, it will be streamed from this page. Uh -huh. uh, pockets. And then the students will click, this is that button, the content button that we looked at earlier. Uh, they'll have a button for continue to next page. And at this point, it's saying that you have reached the end of the lesson and so on and so on. So let's go back here to our configuration in our course page. And now let's say we want to ed edit this page. So one of the options is here on the top right, it says edit page contents, where there is also this edit button here for editing the whole lesson. Edit page contents, it's going to allow us to edit only this specific page that we are working on or looking at. So we click on edit page contents and now we can tinker more with this page if we wanted to. So let's say I don't like that image there anymore and I want to leave just the PowerPoint and I want to leave the YouTube video, then click on Save Page and it's updated and live and ready to go. Now, the next thing that you can do is that you can go into this lesson and add additional items to it. So you can add a short quiz. So let's learn how to add a short assessment quiz to this lesson. It will be all bundled as part of the lesson, not as a separate entity like we discussed earlier in quizzes. So to add a short assessment uh, quiz for this lesson, we can click here under Edit, the Edit tab here. And now it's displaying that we have already one page for this lesson. Now we want to add a new page. Now at this point, it's asking us, well, what kind of page do you want to add? We want to choose a question. It's going to be some kind of form of assessment. So we click on Question. And then it will ask us what type of question we want to ask or utilize. And typically you would want to use true and false, multiple choice, or, and also you can have these other types as well, such as essay questions as another common one. So let's learn first about uh, multiple choice. We click on add a question page after we choose multiple choice. And now it's going to give us the choices or the entry to create the multiple choice questions. We say computers. We type the title. That will be the title for the students to see and also for the computer to record it. But then we need to copy and paste the question. This is what the student will actually see as part of the question. But then it's asking us, well, what's uh, option one? So we say a computer is any device that performs the following functions. So we say accepts input. You could give them an automated response, and this is, by the way, highly recommended that you do when you're configuring those quizzes. So you could say, that is correct. However, I'm going to copy this. And then we are saying here, if the student chooses this option A here, or this answer, what do we want it to do? We are saying, okay, jump to the next page. But then, do we want to give them a, a grade for it, uh, like a score for it? In this case, we'd say, no, that's not the correct answer because there are more pieces for it in order to, this is only one piece of the puzzle for a computer. So then we said processes data. That's option two. So that's again part of a multiple choice question. And then you could give them some kind of instant feedback as soon as they choose this option. This is what will show up and you can customize that. Now it says here jump to you always want to make sure that it jumps to the next page. And at this point, there is no option to make that the default. But you need to make sure that as soon as the student chooses this option, you want them to be able to move forward to the next page in the lesson. As far as the score, if this were the right answer, we'd give them a 1 here or some kind of score. Now, this is still not the right answer. Now, uh, the next option here is stores data. And you give them some feedback. And then you say next page. 
and still they don't get the, uh, this is not correct the correct answer and then answer number four you give them some feedback and you say it's next page again this is very important and there's still no score here but we need one more option here it's not going to be just four questions here but we need to add an additional option so and this is derived from the lesson configuration so we need another choice uh, because I, my uh, multiple choices is going to have five choices so I'm going to click on save page here and we need to tinker with the lesson configuration for just a second here we're going to go here under the edit settings and if you're not going to have more than four answers for your multiple choice you don't need to worry about this you can skip the next minute here uh, we'll go here under edit settings for the lesson and this is by the way how you can change the settings for your lesson and if we go here under number of answers we want to change this to five and go back save and display and then we want to go and edit that question that we created earlier so we click here on the edit tab and then we click here on multiple choice question and we want to tweak it or change it so we want to click on this gear icon to configure it and edit it and then basically we go back to add answer number five so answer number three it's this one stores data answer number four and then option number five is and you could say that is correct and then we click here under the next page and then we choose the score here the score can be anything higher than a zero so you could make it five points depending on how difficult the question is so one of the questions could be five points another one could be two points another one can be 15 points now those will be calculated against the total for that lesson so if you said in the lesson configuration it's going to be graded against 100 points then this if this is 10 points that's going to be 10 percent of this lesson if if it were five points that would be five percent so the percentage here would be against the score for that lesson. Then we click on Save Page, and at this point, we have two pages to our lesson. To preview it, you can click here on Preview, and the student will see the first page here, have to watch the video and so on. Then they have to continue to the next page, and then they have to take this short quiz. And then press Submit. As soon as they press Submit, they'll get the feedback that is correct and so on and they'll continue let's learn about true and false questions so we go here under add a new page under the edit tab for the lesson and then we choose another question here and then we'll say true and false add a question page we give it a title so here for correct response we put uh, true and if they choose a true option here the true response or the correct response this is what you can put as feedback automated feedback and if they choose the correct answer also this is how many points you're going to give them make sure that this says next page and then if they choose the wrong answer which would be false then you can give them feedback automated and then also you can choose the path here so you always need to make sure that it's the next page and then if they choose the wrong answer they will get a zero for this question so then we click on save page and then so far the lesson has three pages now in lessons you can also do an add a page which would have an essay question and also you are presenting content at the same time so the way you do that is by clicking on add a new page and then choose question and then you could say here I want to create an essay question add a new question page and then at this point we'll be able to give it a name here and then in here you could put all kinds of directions so you basically could put all the content that we presented on the first page you could post it in an essay question provided you want them to answer an essay question 
you put the, basically the directions in there, link to PowerPoint like we did earlier. You could put a, a link to a YouTube video if you want them to watch the YouTube video. And then you could say before we're proceeding any further. And uh, you could, of course, make this bold and uh, formatted with different colors and all that type of stuff. And then we are saying here that when we grade this, by the way, we have to grade this usually. So let's say we are going to grade it against 15 points. Then we click on save page. So that will be the score for grading for this part of the activity. Now, so far, we have four pages to our lesson. By the way, most faculty, they would use only this last option that I sh uh, showed here, which would look something like this. Basically, the student clicks on the lesson, you present the directions for it, the student has to respond to it, and so on. Or look under the preview option here. It will look like this. That's the last page. Actually, that's the first page. Then they come to the next page, which would be the quiz. Then they answer another short quiz here. And then this is the last page where you're presenting the content and the student has to type an answer here and then submit it. So that's basically how it will work and this is how it will look for the students. So you as the instructor, you'd go back into your lesson, into your course, and let's say you want to see a report of what's happening and who viewed the lesson and who answered the questions and what the scores were and all that type of thing. So you go into the lesson itself, and then, I don't want to go to the last page I saw, I want to go to the very beginning. And then you go and preview the lesson. You have these options here. You can preview it, basically see what the students see, edit the lesson. But here are a couple other options. There's a reports option where you can see a report of all that the students did. It tells you how long they spent on the lesson and what score they got in that specific lesson. And it'll give you a listing of all the students in this course. Of course, at this point, I have only a couple of students here and only one of them has taken it. Now, the other thing that you can do here is you can view detailed statistics and also you can go in and grade the essays. So to grade the essays, usually this has to be done manually, of course. You have a listing of all the students with all of these responses. Sometimes students may go more than once to take the lesson and therefore you have to grade each one of them as well. So in our case here, we want to grade this. The easiest is to right click on each essay and then click on open link in new tab. Once you open it in new tab, you'll view their response. So it says here my answer. And then you have a box here to put your comments and also you have an option to grade this. If you remember, we gave it 15 points, so the highest points it gives you a drop down of that number for this specific question. So you give it a score here, save changes, and then go back to your lesson. Now, after you grade those, you can also email all the students those graded essay questions and they will get the feedback that you provided for them. So I strongly suggest you can email individual students directly from this link next to their item or you can click on email all essays and it will email it to all of them. Now, in this case, if we go here to reports, if you noticed earlier, the score earlier, it was 33.33 because we had not graded yet the essay question. Now, notice once we graded the essay question, they have a 50% score and that score was automatically updated. Now, those grades they trickle down to the grade book. So if we go here to our test course and we go to the grades, now for this lesson, that um, will show up also in the grade book. So here it is, lesson one, and that's the grade that this student received. 
So that's how lessons work. I hope it was clear enough to potentially make sense of it and try it and experiment with it. But it's a powerful feature that you can uh, utilize more effectively for your courses. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to configure attendance in Moodle or eLearning. In each course, you need to create one instance of the attendance module. And the attendance module is an add-on module to the standard Moodle installation or the e-learning installation. So to create the attendance module, we first need to turn editing on in the course. So we click here on the gear icon, then click on turn editing on. And then typically, you'd put the attendance somewhere at the very top of the course here. We click on add an activity or a resource, and then we choose the option for attendance. Then click on add. And you can leave the name the way it is. And for the description, you can put a description if you'd prefer. Now under the grade area, this is where you would specify whether you're going to penalize the students who are missing attendance or not penalizing them. So. In this case, I'm going to leave it uh, using points. So it's going to use points and then 100 points. Then here under the grade category, you could also choose what category you want to apply the attendance to, provided you have configured the grade book. Then uh, scroll down and then simply click on Save and Return to the Course. So far, we just have uh, configured an item here in the system called attendance. However, we have not defined yet as to what weeks and when the class meets and when to take attendance in this class. So to do that, we need to click here under Add Session. And then we specify the date when the class starts and date as well. So let's say the class starts on September 1st. Now here you can choose either the drop down here, these for each area. So September 1st, 2019. Or you could have chosen this calendar option here as well. And then let's say the class starts at 9 a.m. Notice that these times here, they would be in the military time. And then let's say that the class ends at 10 a.m. in this case. And then here under description, this is where we want to put something to simply identify each instance for this class. And then under the next option here, it says create calendar event for this session. Basically, that's going to add it to the student calendar in e-learning or Moodle here. Now, if we simply leave it with these options and then come down here and press Add, the system is going to create only one instance for September 1, 2019. However, you can also choose here multiple sessions, and you can choose to repeat the configuration that we defined here above. We can repeat it to a particular set criteria. So basically, we put a check mark in here under Repeat This Session, and we say that the class, for example, starts on every Monday, or this class takes place every Monday, every Wednesday, and Friday from 9 to 10 o'clock. And then you could state that you want to repeat this every week. That's provided, you, of course, your class typically meets weekly. Or, and so basically you'd leave that there as number one, every one week. And then we'd repeat this, let's say, until December 12th, 2019. And then further down here, you can choose to allow the students to record their own attendance as well if you'd prefer. If you need help with this, you could simply click on that option and learn more about that function. Then click on Add. And now notice that the sessions have been created for each time for that sequence of parameters that we defined earlier. So this would be from September 2nd, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, all the way till December 12th. Now, if for some reason, let's say it's a Thanksgiving or it's a, a time that you are not meeting with your students and such, in that case, you can simply go to that particular week 
and simply delete that particular instance. So let's say I want to delete this one for 11.25. Let's assume that's Thanksgiving here in that specific date or Thanksgiving break. We can click here, find the specific date, and then simply choose to delete the session. Now, if for some reason you entered the wrong dates and all that type of stuff, it's probably easiest and best to simply go to the main course page, delete the activity completely, and then recreate the steps that I simply did so far. Now, under the attendance here, notice also that you have these additional controls here, so you can see all pro uh, past attendance records, although you can view it by month, by week, or by specific days as well. If you cannot locate something, just make sure you choose the All option here. Now, one other thing here is under the Status Set, this is where you can specify how you want to mark the students in the class. How do you mark them and what points you want to assign to them? So, for example, for them to show up for class, they could get, if you can mark them as P for present, or that would be the a definition for it basically and um, L for late and that would be one point and then E uh, would be for excused and A would be for absent. You can change those to, uh, to be a different type of acronym in a different description and different points as well. This comes in handy if you're grading this activity, if you're keeping track of the attendance and, and, and then impacting the student's grade. That's how you configure attendance in e-learning or in Moodle. Next, we're going to learn how to take attendance in a class in Moodle. In this session, I'll demonstrate how to take attendance in e-learning or Moodle, the Moodle learning management system. Earlier, I demonstrated how to configure the attendance in the course and if you need help with that, please refer to the previous tutorial on configuring the attendance. Now I'm going to demonstrate how to actually take attendance in class. So typically you'd go to the course and then you'd scroll down to and find the attendance record. It's uh, important to understand that you need only one of those records on the course page here. You don't need to create one for each week that the class meets because you create that within this attendance record. You click on it, and then you find the day that you want to record the attendance for the students. So let's say we go here under the 4th of October, and you find that specific date, and then you click on this blue triangle here, which says Take Attendance. Once we click on Take Attendance here, then simply you can you basically be able to see a list of students here in your course and then the easiest would be to simply press P here for present for all students so you're marking everybody present and then you call everybody's name in the class and then you mark the ones that are either not present or excused and such now here you can also put notes so if I mark this as excused, you could put notes in there, see email from 10.1. So basically, these notes, these remarks would be for your own reference. And then simply press Save Attendance here. And now attendance has been taken for October 4th. So if we scroll down, the record where we have taken attendance here would be clickable. Notice the other ones, you couldn't click on them un unless you click on the blue triangle here. And you can either click on the actual record here to open it up and update something about the attendance in the class. Or you could go to this green icon on the right hand side of that specific record and you can change the attendance and update, for example, somebody who uh, eventually showed up for class, you can go and mark them as present if necessary. And then press Save Changes. Now the students, of course, will be able to see uh, their own records on their end when they sign into the system. 
as well as you here being able to see a report of all the users in this class. So if we go here under report, and this is how you'd be able to see it, click on report, you'd be able to see specifically for each student when they were present and when they didn't show up for class. Notice here that on 10-4 that I took the attendance here, this is how it will show up if everybody is present. If uh, somebody is absent, they would have a score of 0 out of 2. And then they uh, see the percentage in the very far right and such. So that's how you take attendance in the course, and that's how you update the records for the attendance in the e-learning system. In this brief video, I'll demonstrate how to create a Zoom activity, a live web conferencing session within your course in e-learning or Moodle. Now, this also assumes that you have already configured and integrated Zoom into Moodle. In our case here at Cairn University, we have Zoom configured and it's available for all courses in the learning management system. So to schedule and configure a Zoom activity, we simply need to go to that particular week or unit in the course. Then we click under Add an Activity or a Resource, and then simply scroll down and choose Zoom Meeting. Then click on Add, and then provide a name for this item. I'm going to keep the numbers in sequence there, so I'm going to name it 1.8 Live Web Conference. It's also, if you're teaching online, it's important that you state also the time zone and such. And then under the description area, you might want to put uh, details in there about this particular activity. So here you could state that uh, a webcam is required and also a link for them to test the system beforehand. And this is the valid link to put in your course. And you can also hyperlink it as well. And provide additional directions. Now, if you want this to show up on the main course page, you simply put a check mark here, display description on the main course page, and uh, that will be supplemented with those directions. Now, by default here, you technically could simply click and leave all these other options alone here and simply click on Save and Return to the course. Now, this means that you can start this meeting at any point, and it's not tied to any dates or times. The students will join you based on the title on the top of your item that you created on the course. If you'd prefer to set a specific date and time, then you need to uncheck this recurring option and then put the correct date and time. And remember that you cannot test this until half an hour prior to the scheduled time. So make sure that those dates and times are correct here. The other option here as well is notice that it's going to enable to join before the host. That means that the students can actually start this meeting before you are ready to join them and get in there. Typically, the system will also email you that your students are waiting for you, and it serves as a, a nice reminder in case you forgot to join the meeting. Now, once you are set with that, whether you are choosing the recurring option or the dates here, it doesn't matter which one option you choose, and then you press Save and Return to the course. Then, in this case, the students and you will start the meeting from here. So you'll need to advise the students that all these Zoom meetings will start from the course. And you and the students will click on it. You'll see the details. They'll be able to test the system if necessary. And then you, as the owner of this meeting, have the option to start it. And the students typically have the option to join. Their button here will be a blue button. It will say, join meeting. Once you press start meeting, it will prompt you to launch your web camera and your microphone and you'll be set. So it will look like this. 
you might need to click on open zoom meetings and that's in case you didn't have zoom installed in your computer it's going to prompt you to install it to download and install a small piece of software and you just install it just like any other item on your computer then you click on open meeting and then you can choose here join with computer audio or you can use and the students as well could join by using a phone call so in case they have audio issues they can dial any of these numbers and then put in this meeting ID and they'll be able to listen to what's happening in the course using a regular phone if we wanted to join here using a, a computer they'll simply click here join using computer audio and then you're up and running then you can control the microphone from here you can start with a video so make sure you are able to choose to start with a video from here so you just click on it once and then under manage participants this is where you can see who has joined you in your meeting then when it comes time for you to let's say you're interacting with the students their cameras are on and you're interacting with them and such then if you want to go over the lesson or something and share something from the course page you simply by the way this toolbar and notice it uh, disappears at times so you simply move the mouse to the bottom and it will show up at this point you can click on share if you want to share your screen and then you simply click on share again and then it's going to uh, share whatever you have on the desktop so whatever at this point you want uh, to demonstrate to the students on your PC here or your on your course they'll be able to see it from their end now I'm going to go back let's say to the course here and all of this it will be projected to their screens keep in mind if you move the mouse to the very top of the screen here notice there is also this annotate tool that you can utilize and uh, you can simply then highlight and underline things and go over things just like as if it were a whiteboard or a touch screen on your computer so then move the mouse to the very top and then those tools will show up again when you're ready to stop the sharing you can click here on stop share on the top and that will stop the screen sharing with uh, with your students by the way the students can share the screens as well so you can invite them to do their presentation or to share their screen in a similar way notice that by default the meeting is going to be recorded and you can control it from up here the recording it's best typically to let it record and then send and post the link to that recording the next day uh, once you receive an email about it in your course for other students that might have missed this live session keep in mind also that there is an option here for chat and this is where you'll see the any students that have questions they might post the questions in there and you can respond also to individual students or to everyone from the same area here once you're done with the meeting to close it you simply click here on end and notice it's kind of hiding behind my screen here but uh, it's in the bottom right here end meeting and then it'll prompt you to end the meeting for all and at this point after about depending on how long your meeting was uh, anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour this time you'll receive an email with a link to the recording in this session, I'll demonstrate how to link two courses in e-learning and create a meta course. A meta course is when you have two courses, the second course is linked to the first one, and then the students uh, from the second course, they show up on course one, and also they show up in the grade book. The benefit for it is the faculty maintaining only one of the courses instead of two. So here's how it's done. You basically go to the main course that you want to make as the primary. In this case, it's TSL 692, or we use the grad versions, typically in making them the main one. So we go to the grad version of the course. Then we go here under participants. Then we go under the gear icon here and then choose enrollment methods. Then we click here on add a method and then click on course meta link 
and then search for the course. In this case, the faculty has requested TSL 492 to be added to e-learning as the secondary course. So you can just simply type TSL 492, and this may take a while to come up. Make sure that it matches the semester, so you have fall 18. And then once you have made sure it's the proper course, and then the proper section as well, in some cases you might have section 01 and section 00, and 00 needs to be linked with the grad version of 00, and 01 may need to be linked to the 01 section of the grad version. So just pay attention to that. And then click on Add Method. And now at this point, that's all that you have to do to link the courses. So the students from the 492 section will have access to the grad version of it. At this point, advise the faculty that they need to post a note on the undergrad version or on the second course for the students to use the grad section of the course or the main course or the meta course in this case.